Hello, welcome to the fourth episode of Meet the Professor. Today's guest is Professor Eric Small of Rollins College, where he's Professor of Philosophy and coach of the debate team. He is also a medical ethicist at FSU. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Small. Thank you, Arjun, for having me. Yeah. So to begin, I wanted to ask, how did you become interested in philosophy or what was your first introduction? So my first introduction to philosophy was through an after school program. So I went to school in Washington, DC. And after school, there were these programs that would bring students from different high schools together to discuss political issues mostly, but then we would also discuss moral issues. As we got deeper into the discussions, questions arose about why the answers that we were arriving at were the right answers to have, which naturally led me into thinking about the theoretical basis for the answers that we were arriving at, and also for the moral basis for the moral answers we were arriving at. And that uh, led me into philosophy. Yeah, for sure. So given your experience and what you know as a professor and as a student, um, why do you think people, students in particular, should pursue philosophy? Well, so I think that philosophy provides the basis for every other field that is possible for humans to study. So Aristotle, of course, is thought of as the father of all the sciences because he organized them. But in addition to organizing them, he gave us, he and Plato and other of the ancient philosophers provided us with the metaphysical and theoretical basis for engaging in politics, or ethics or different um, investigations of science like biology or chemistry. And so philosophy will provide the ultimate justification for why we do the things we do. So that's one reason why I think people should engage in the study of philosophy because it will better enhance what are their practical endeavors. But yeah. in addition to that, philosophy will help you become a better person because it requires you to answer questions like, who, I, who am I? And why is it that what I think is right or wrong? Or why ought I to do a particular thing? So it's constantly pushing us to engage in self-evaluation. And so I think it's great for that purpose too. Yeah, for sure. And if students do want to explore like the philosophical underpinnings of like other uh, branches of society or delve more into their personal identity, what sort of papers, uh, publications, podcasts, stuff like that should they be looking into to get, a, to, like, get an introduction to this field? Okay, so I think this is a great question. And I generally don't advise that people start with reading books in philosophy or that they start with philosophical podcasts because those things often presume that you have some basis for understanding what they're doing. So for students, I would advise more that they enter into activities at their school and then engage in philosophy through the activity. So some activities that I think are great and natural for introductions to philosophy are debating or forensic science, if you have a forensic science team or investigative journalism. So I would advise a student to say, join the debate team. And one of the things that'll happen when you're on the debate team is they'll pose a question. This house believes that America is the greatest nation ever in the history of the world. Some team will have to argue yes for it and some team will have to argue no for it. But in debate, it's not just providing practical answers, it's also justifying those answers, which will lead people into thinking about the basis or the justification, the theory behind the answers that they're given. So debating as a practical enterprise is good for leading students into seeking out the theoretical answers that they'll need to justify their answers. And that's a great way to be introduced into philosophy. You'll find the same thing is true in investigative journalism. And it's also true in forensic sciences. So I often tell students to start with activities because the activity is what they'll enjoy, but the activity will naturally push them into engaging intellectual questions of the theoretical basis for their answer. And that's the best way, I think, for younger people to engage in philosophy. Afterwards, you'll find that you'll naturally be led to seek out theories like Aristotle's theory of politics, or John Stuart Mill's theory of liberty, 
or Plato's theory of dialectical reasoning in order to answer those questions. And so that's when you'll get into the um, philosophy of the activity that you're engaged in. Yeah, that sounds like really good advice for students interested in philosophy. So now that we've discussed like philosophy generally, I wanted to get a little bit into your research. So one place that I know you've done research in is about organ donation. And how does this realm of ethics pose unique challenges? And lastly, can you elaborate more on your research and positions in this area? Okay, so let's take a step back. Part of my expertise is medical ethics. And in addition to being a philosophy professor at Rollins College, I am a clinical ethicist at Florida State University School of Medicine. And so when I am acting as a clinical ethicist and writing and thinking as a clinical ethicist, I engage in questions about organ donation, at least part of the time. And what led me to thinking about organ donation is a question about human consciousness and whether or not consciousness um, among humans is a necessary condition for us to act, which led, to, which led me into all, uh, many other different questions. But ultimately, as I researched the question of consciousness, I started researching the questions of interconnected um, neurology. So from your brain to other parts of your body. And if you switch out parts of your body, say like an organ, um, through something like a heart transplant, does that change your consciousness or does that change your neurology? And if not, then does it entail that we can switch any part of our bodies out with others without changing our neurology? And then what would that mean for something like a brain, a brain transplant? Those so questions about human consciousness that ultimately led me into uh, investigating things like organ transplantation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, given that you write a lot about metal, medical ethics, but you also wrote about like civil liberties and national emergencies and how to balance those during emergency times. Uh, I was wondering what your positions and philosophies impact on the current pandemic, where we are facing both a medical crisis and a balancing of civil liberties and national security. Well, thank you for this question. I think this is an excellent one. So on the question of civil liberties and its relationship to medical ethics, we are currently in a pandemic in the United States and of course the world, which raises both fundamental civil liberties questions. That is, what are the government's powers to restrict the movements of people or to restrict the speech of people or the sharing of information of people vis-a-vis -vis the particular uh, a time of emergency that we're in, which is a pandemic now. And so does the government have the power to restrict your movement, that is tell you to stay in the house or when you go outside that you have to wear a mask or that you have to get a vaccine? And you'll notice that today you have at least three different answers to the question. The first type of answer that you'll get is something like a strict libertarian answer. It says, all individuals are personally responsible for what happens with them and their families. So those individuals have the ability and the rights, that is the civil liberty part. So first they have the ability, the mental capacity, they're autonomous people, and they have the rights, the civil liberties to determine for themselves and their families, whether they'll stay in the house or go outside, whether they'll wear a mask or not, and whether they'll get a vaccine. So those are the strict libertarians. And you see them resisting state policies that say wear a mask or get a vaccine. The second group is what you might think of as liberals. They tell us that the state has some ability to pass policies that will protect the overall good. So they argue that the state can shut down the economy and tell people to stay at home as long as the state is also willing to provide means so that people can subsist. So the people who argue for the liberal position will say the state can shut down the economy, but also provide relief or bailouts for the people so that they can get food or pay for their shelter or get access to water. And then they'll also say, while the state might not be able to impose vaccines, the state can encourage vaccines and it can encourage private corporations to require their employees to get vaccines. 
And so under the liberal position, the state can do some things and encourage others, but it doesn't have the power to do anything that it wants. Which leads us to the final position, which is an egalitarian position. And it argues that, well, the state is the ultimate source of coercion. And the state has the ability to tell people that you cannot come outside, that you must wear a mask, or that you must get a vaccine. And so it has the strongest position on the state. And in the United States, we have different politicians who take different versions of those three positions. And that's why you see so much disagreement about how the United States government ought to act with respect to the coronavirus and state policy. Whereas when you look at other countries, say China, for example, they have a very strong state that has broad powers to require people to do certain things. And so you don't see the public disagreement among Chinese politicians and citizens that you'll see in the United States. So for my research, I often write, talk, and think about the balance between the state's authority to tell us to do things for the pr purpose of protecting us in an emergency and the individual civil liberties that Americans have to resist the state's power to impose on us. Yeah, for sure. I know you discuss a lot of historical philosophical traditions there and, and stuff about that. So my last question to conclude was, who is your favorite historic, who, who is your favorite philosopher, whether that be historical or contemporary? And it might be your just favorite like position or the most influential on you, either of those two. Yeah, so this is always a tough question for a philosopher. Who's your favorite philosopher, especially a philosopher like me, where I have a broad range of areas in which I write in. But I, I would say the philosophy of John Locke has probably had the greatest impact on my thinking about the relationship between the state and medicine or the relationship between the state and civil liberties. So John Locke or the relationship between the state and international relations and human rights. So I think John Locke has had the greatest impact. And I think he is one of my favorite philosophers, if not my most favorite philosopher. And like me, John Locke had a, a broad range of um, areas in which he wrote, in which he published and thought. And so for that reason, he's provided a lot of, he's provided the source for a lot of research for the stuff that I've written about. But then there are a lot of other philosophers that I follow and I think a lot about. Um, V.S. Ramachandran is a neurologist. And so when I'm talking about consciousness and thinking about consciousness, I turn to V.S. Ramachandran. When I'm not thinking about V.S. Ramachandran, if I'm thinking ancient philosophy, I, or if I'm thinking ancient African philosophy, Hypatia is one of my favorite thinkers and writers. So I have a lot of thinkers and writers that I follow, but John Locke is probably my favorite and certainly the most influential on what I think about and write about. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Small. I think that's all the questions I have for today. But once again, I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to join us today. Thank you for having me, and I, I wish you great success, success with this process. Thank you.